if you have things like, you know, you, you need a therapist who is an autism specialist, you need a diagnosis, um, you need perhaps, you know, disability benefits, something like that, where you have to prove that you have actually got autism, that's quite difficult if you are a very fluent masker. So hello, it's been a really, really long time since I've made an Asperger's related video and it's kind of perfect timing for it because a lot of stuff has changed in my life, Asperger's wise, regarding the treatment I'm getting and things like that. So I have quite a lot to say, but what really propelled me to make a video today was somebody posing me some really, really interesting questions on Instagram this morning regarding masking, that this person has a young female relative who shows a lot of autistic traits, doesn't really fit in with the world, feels pretty much like a classic autistic teenager, but is as yet undiagnosed, which I think is a struggle that a lot of people can relate to. Um, and the main questions that this person was asking, they were asking about masking and is there some way that you can learn to mask so that you can fit in better? Um, if you are masking and you are good at masking, can you unmask? Are there pros and cons to masking? And I thought these were all really, really interesting questions to ask. Um, because like I like I think pretty much all Aspies, with masking and what I do, I had to learn how to do it by rote. And I have made a video, if you if you search back, I did make a video about social interaction for Aspies or social interaction for awkward people or something like that, which basically set out the rules of social interaction that I eventually came up with and literally taught myself social interaction via that. Um, however, these rules have now become so completely automatic to me that although I've seen a lot of videos lately about unmasking, I thought I wouldn't know how to go about it. Particularly if you're a female Aspie, by the time you're in your about mid-twenties or so, masking becomes so automatic that, I mean, I mean, there, there are, there are certain things like, you know, if you're around certain people, you don't talk about your obsessive interests, or you don't flap about too much, or you, you know, you try and fidget less, and th things like that that are always going to be forced things that you have to force yourself to do in certain situations, and when you get home you're flailing and fiddling and talking about your obsessive interests all you like, and th there are things like that, but I think my general social persona is so ingrained to me now that I wouldn't know how to unmask. And yes, there are there are pros and cons to masking. Um, obviously, the good things about masking are that yes, you you fit in more easily. People don't notice that you're autistic, particularly. I mean, people do. <laughs> people notice eventually, or often instantly, that that you're a little bit weird. They <laughs> notice something, but it's it's not so glaring, and and people don't find it so off putting. Um, and I think a good example of this is that when I was about sixteen, seventeen years old. A friend of mine who's still a friend to this day, he commented once, I find it really hard to talk to you. Like, I like you, but I find it really hard to talk to you. It's really hard to keep conversation going. Whereas by the time I had learned a bit of masking, I remember going to um, an eating disorder meetup with a load of people I'd never met in person before, so totally like anxiety provoking situation. And after that meetup, I got a message saying, I am so glad you came to this meetup. You completely got rid of all the awkwardness because you just babbled. <laughs> and um, that was one of my major rules of social interaction. Awkward silences are everybody's biggest fear. So no matter what pops into your head, so long as it's not a direct insult, just say it. Just say it. Say anything. Say anything. Babble. Everyone would rather listen to babbling than silence. So my, my social fluency went from you are really hard to be around to like, we like you being around. You make us feel comfortable. So that's that's one pro to uh, or one positive to masking. The downside to masking that I have found regards mostly treatment for autism. That this summer, because of having a bunch of mental health crap go down, um, I have ended up with a new psychologist who is an Asperger's specialist. I got really lucky. And I also have someone else in my life who's, who's another kind of worker who's pretty good with these things. But the psychologist particularly, Asperger's specialist, 
and she has said to me you know the things you write because she's she's had me like write a few things about about my life she says when you write about yourself your autism is glaring <laughs> and she said you know in person like i'm an asperger specialist i can tell that you're glaringly autistic however the average person probably wouldn't this is going to interfere in your life when it comes to getting the right kind of care. So if you have things like, you know, you, you need a therapist who is an autism specialist, you need a diagnosis, um, you need perhaps, uh, you know, disability benefits, something like that, where you have to prove that you have actually got autism, um, that's quite difficult if you are a very fluent masker. And uh, so these are some of the cons of masking. And, you know, when she said that to me, that was when I really started thinking, well, if I, you know, if and when I'm ever in these situations, how, how do I be become more autistic? How do I take away these layers that I've put on for so many flipping years? Having been undiagnosed for so many years, there was never a point at which in my youth, I, it was like, you're autistic, it's okay for you to be different. It was always, you're just lazy, you're undiagnosed, there's nothing wrong with you, try harder. And I think that really forced me to mask hard and I wouldn't know how to unmask now. However, I have noticed this summer that I have started doing it by accident <laughs> and that is I think because of having these people in my life, having this Asperger specialist in my life, having another worker in my life who is totally chill with all kinds of mental health issues, I, I've i always had this thing like my, my masking slips <laughs> whenever I'm talking about something very personal or trying to explain something in detail and at that point my eye contact thing just goes to it. And I note I noticed this because of doing YouTube. I noticed that whenever I'm talking about certain things, my vision drifts over here and I start talking to the door. And usually whenever I notice that I'm doing this, I immediately correct and I go back to making eye contact and I start talking to the person. But because I've been having so many therapy sessions with people who were like, it's okay, you be as autistic as you like. When I notice myself doing it now, I just think Fuck it, it's fine. You know, they, they don't care. I'm just, I'm better at uh, you know, expressing myself when I'm not looking at someone, so I'm just going to talk to the light switch, you know, <laughs> so I do. And then I tried to make a video yesterday, and I didn't notice that I was doing this for half of the video, and then I suddenly realised, hang on, I've literally been talking to the light switch for about 10 minutes. And I tried to correct it, and I tried to give eye contact to the camera, and for the first time in about, I don't know how many years, trying to look directly into the camera felt like staring into the sun. Um, it, even though it's not an eye, it's not eye contact, it's not someone looking back at me, it felt like staring directly into the sun. It felt very intimidating. And I, when I watched that video back, I scrapped it and I was like, I'm re-recording this. This is so unengaging. Like watching someone talking over here is just unengaging. It really is. You don't keep someone's attention. And I, I have found this with other autistic YouTubers over the years. Most of us seem to be quite good at giving eye contact to a camera because it's not an eye, but there are some who just can't and who just, you know, they're, they're talking to the floor or the wall or the ceiling all the time. And I find it very hard to get through their videos because something about someone staring you directly in the face keeps your attention it's like they're demanding your attention they're talking to you um and i think this is this is one of the problems with with asperger's and with the eye contact thing that people think you're not interested in their conversation because you're not looking at them and a big a big show of interest is that you're keeping eye contact and you're constantly going mm, yeah aha uh -huh, and you're you know you're reacting constantly to their facial expressions and their body movement and you can't do any of that if you're not looking at them <laughs> so yeah i've i've suddenly started noticing that as i've let myself slip into not giving eye contact i am finding it very hard now to drag myself back to giving eye contact so i would say if you do decide <laughs> that ever you know the unmasking is is going to be something you're going to try that you're going to you know embrace your true self be be more like who you were meant to be rather than trying to be normal all the time um I would say be cautious with that because when you slip into these behaviors that are natural to you it's very hard to put the fake behaviors back on again and I would say something that might be useful if you do think you struggle with eye contact or you're simply curious to see how much you struggle with eye contact get your phone work out precisely where the camera on your phone is maybe use the back camera so that you're not seeing your reflection in the screen 
and just just talk to yourself for a bit. I'm not saying you have to become a fucking YouTuber or anything. Just tell the camera about your day and just talk to it like it was a person and just see when you watch it back. And yes, it's always weird watching yourself back for the first few times and hearing your voice and all of that. But just see how much eye contact you manage to give and just see the effect that it gives, like how much more engaging you seem when you give eye contact. However, I would say don't worry if you do slip away quite a lot into staring at the wall. Um, because I, I saw on, on the news the other day, there was this adorable, adorable girl on the news. I say girl, woman. Um, she was a lab geek talking about coronavirus and you could see, you could tell, you could tell so obviously that she was autistic because the minute they started talking to her she lit up like a light bulb about her lab geekery and it was clearly her favorite subject in the world and she went off and off and off about it um but her eye contact was it was all over the place you could see her her trying going i know i have to do this and uh, and and it was all over the place and there was something so endearing about how weird she was that when I first saw her before she started talking I just thought yeah average girl and the minute she started talking with this weird eye contact all over the place and this this enthusiasm and this flailiness I fell in love with her I was like give me your number you're gorgeous something about the fact that she kept snatching her attention away from you just as you were looking into these big brown eyes and you were getting caught up in her enthusiasm she would snatch her attention away from you and she would take it somewhere else and you'd think where did you go where did you go what's going on in your brain what's going on you're mysterious what is this so I actually think that this this kind of on and off eye contact that a struggling Aspie tends to give is actually quite cute and quite endearing. I think it can be. Um, so don't feel that you have to like stare into the sun fixedly <laughs> with every person you talk to. But um, yeah, learning to mask was, was the other question and how can you do that? And obviously that is an understandable question for a teenager who probably probably has a life much like I did as a teenager whereby you don't fit in, nobody gets you, you're bullied, everything's awful, everything sucks and uh man, bullied lonely teenagers just hit me in the emotional nutsack so hard it's just the most horrible thing to to think back to and to think that anyone on earth is still going through that um is so horrible. It's understandable that at that point you would want to learn to mask, you would want you want to learn to fit in. Um uh, my advice on that would be multiple fold. Um, for starters, I would say trying to fit in rarely stops you being bullied, for starters. Um, the harder you fake being something you're not, the more servile and unfortunately pathetic you tend to seem. And speaking from experience, whenever I was trying to fit in and I was wearing adidas trousers and all the chavvy stuff and I was you know trying to fit in super super hard I was bullied to shit because it wasn't me and my confidence was visibly not there the the first thing you develop and I've talked about this before but if you're a bullied kid you tend to develop this awful posture this kind of hunched head down posture hiding you've usually got like side parted hair that's in your face so you can hide behind it and everywhere you go you're like this you're hunched over looking down you can tell the bullied kid from a mile away and if you take this bullied kid out of the bad school and you move them across town you go to another school guess what they're going to get bullied again within the first week because they have a target on their back due to this posture they have um so i would say honestly the best way to fit in is to find something that gives that kid confidence um, and ideally something that gives them a good posture too so whether that's learning something like karate dance horseback riding uh skateboarding something that gives them a posture that stands them up and stands them tall and gives them a kind of don't fuck with me posture even if you just literally have to teach them that in the mirror stand up up straight because you you know it's a target on your back this slumped thing tie your hair back stop hiding behind your hair you've just got to go balls out and stop hiding for a while and seriously it will get better um but otherwise embracing what makes you you and having confidence in that is is going to be better but obviously yes having obvious autistic traits is likely to get you bullied no matter how confident you are unfortunately um 
but learning to mask some autistic people do really go out and i would say this is mostly the males because it does come more easily as so many people have commented on self-included females find it easier to mask because our brains are just better wired towards social cues and empathy and we tend to find it easier to learn social cues and social interaction whereas male autistic brains just don't have a clue basically and it's it's a real struggle for them so some male autistics will go out into the world and will very deliberately study humans and think okay this is look at the way that that person is standing towards that person that's maybe how I should stand point your feet towards the other person you're talking to um you know do this touch them every approximately every three minutes give them a little touch on the arm you know <laughs> very very obvious things and, and this is not that abnormal actually I mean look at all the videos on the internet about how to flirt how to tell if a woman's into you and neurotypical people do exactly the same thing too just just to a lesser degree um, but for me, learning to mask kind of in terms of social interaction <laughs> came in ways that I can't in all good conscience recommend to uh, any young teenager because for me it was really going out clubbing and being initially drunk. Even neurotypical people get quite anxious at, at social gatherings, they have a few drinks, they loosen up, they find it easier to talk and I found this too that when I was drunk this was where I started learning these rules that people hate awkward silences, just babble something. And I learned this by being drunk and babbling, you know, just things coming to head and just, just spewing them out and finding that actually people would laugh at the randomness and it was, it was fine. And then there was a conversation going and, um, and you, you start to learn actually, you know, conversation, conversating, is that even a word? Conversations aren't that scary. Talking to people isn't that scary. Um, there are ways to do it. You can make people laugh. Actually, it's okay. Talking to people isn't that scary. So maybe it's just a matter of practice. Maybe Maybe it's not a matter of necessarily being drunk but um just a matter of practice and that was when I learned another one of my social rules <laughs> which was asking questions and the fact that people love to talk about themselves best of all so I would if I was going to hang out with someone I would go to their Facebook or whatever the day before see what was going on in their life things like you know do they have a new cat do they have a new job uh, is their mother sick so that when you talk to them you can ask questions about these things and say how's the new cat going how's the new job doing how's your mom whatever and you have questions to lead with and you can let people talk and you you get closer to people and you learn to take a genuine interest in people because I think one of the problems with autistic people that can get us seen as selfish is the fact that we are so obsessed with our own personal interests and a lot of the time we can be bad listeners when we're younger I think I think we can be very good listeners when we get older but when we're young we just want to talk about the things that interest us so we drag all conversations round to say dinosaurs or horse riding or drugs in my case when I was young um, you drag all conversations around to that and all the time that someone is talking about something else you're not really listening you're just waiting for your turn to talk about your favorite subject and uh, I learned you know what it's actually cool to get to know people it's cool to hear their stories and it's they can make you laugh too and it's it, and I think I learned to relax as well because I think another part of this is that we're not deliberately being bad listeners we're just so tense about interacting that when we're not speaking we're constantly thinking about what am I going to say next what am I going to say next well I've got to appear normal remember eye contact what am I going to say next and you you don't actually manage to concentrate on what they're saying um whereas when I was in this relaxed space and everything was feeling kind of warm and fuzzy and you know you're you're talking you you kind of learn actually I can listen and it's interesting and I can let people talk so yeah it's quite hard for me in short this is quite a long waffle now but um in short it's it's quite hard for me to recommend how to learn to mask um when that was the way that i did it but uh i would say just just be around be around your people try and try and find a group that i mean maybe maybe an autism group actually might be a good place to go an autism group where you can be as autistic as you like and uh and i dare say a lot of these groups are not di uh, dependent on having an official diagnosis you can probably maybe go on a letter of recommendation from a GP or something saying I think I have this um, I've done a lot of research can you recommend me you know a, a local meeting or something that might be somewhere to find your people or if you do have specialized interests try and find a group that's about them obviously this is um, rather null and void information while Covid is going on 
But equally, with all of these things usually going on on Zoom or WhatsApp at the moment, it might be easier in a way to talk to people over a computer that I would say most Aspies we are slightly computer leaning. We do like our computer interaction. I mean, apart from anything, the thing I love about online chat things is that if it gets awkward and you've had enough, you literally, you literally just, you know, slide your hand towards the, the button and you just blip and it's gone and you know and if anyone says anything you can just say your computer crashed <laughs> and, um, you've, you've always got a get out clause it's it's fantastic you're not trapped anywhere because that's one of my big things is being trapped um <laughs> so yeah fight you know try and find your people and practice talking to them and I mean, if you have shared interests in common the conversation is probably going to flow and as conversations flow you tend to learn your own list of social rules and how to fit in um and, uh, and yeah, I will try and find actually my video about social interaction for Aspies and I will link it below. But but yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts and, and the ways the ways that you feel you mask and whether you are consciously able to mask and unmask that. Yeah, I, I found once I had my social rules in place, I would go out and I would just click into this social mode. And it, oftentimes I would be thinking back when my eating disorder was at its worst, I would be thinking this is crazy. Like... I'm around all these people, I seem totally normal, everyone thinks I'm totally normal apart from what I look like, and yet what I spend the rest of my time doing is so completely f***ed up. How am I managing to be so fluent around these people? I am so chronically depressed, and yet I'm like this smiley character around these people, and it just, it came naturally, it was a complete act, but it came so naturally eventually. Um, that was quite weird, and I mean, eventually that did become my personality and the depression faded away and that became my personality. Admittedly, I still find it exhausting being around people and being on and being trying to be entertaining at all times. I, I find it very hard to just be relaxed around people and to just kind of Netflix and chill and not constantly be trying to make people laugh and be interesting and all the rest of it. But uh, anyway, yes, you, you tell me what, what you think the, the bad things about masking and the good things are and if you have any ways of learning useful masking techniques or, or the ways that you learned did you have this list of social rules that you gave yourself and eventually became automatic or are you still consciously thinking of them when you're when you're out and about i'm intrigued to hear these things but uh anyway i hope i really hope that this young teenager manages to get a diagnosis because that helps so much. Knowing knowing what the fuck is up with you and who your people are and why it is that you are the way you are and that it's not your fault and you're not lazy and you're not awful, you're not selfish and you're not difficult and all the rest of it. Um, that's so important and it gets better. It does get better once you are older and you are out of school and you are away from the cruelty of other children because children honestly are some of the cruelest beasts on earth. Ah. <laughs> um, <sighs> you know, don't don't listen to the people who were popular at school saying, oh, school is the best years of your life, because if you're a bullied teenager and you hear that, you think, my God, well, how bad is the rest of it then? Because this is hell. How bad is the rest of it? I don't think I can do this. Um, and uh, that's a whole video that I would like to make, really, is, is just advice that I would give to my younger self and to anyone who is still in that position. Um, but anyway, this is long. I'm going to literally shut up now, over and out. Bye-bye. <laughs>